Wait, this no, conference will now be recorded. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the Center Coast Writers Conference webinar, miraculous webinar <laughs> with Linda Aaron. <laughs> Stella, hello from Cape Town. And where's Sophia? Sophia, Sophia was on. Uh, so, I no, she, Sophia. She's Has still she here. Um, every, <laughs> I've muted everybody and turned off air there, Sophia. <laughs> Hello, Sophia. I'm so sorry. Look, you know, God knows what was happening. Anyway, okay. look, I'm here. I'm a nervous wreck, but you know, we shall continue. And it's lovely of you to actually hold on with us. Hello, Trish. I can see all these names coming. It's really lovely. All right. So, um, look, we're here. I'm really thrilled to be here. And uh, let's just kick off. And I, the other thing is that I have actually done a little recording of this. So, if if the worst comes to the worst. Uh, I will put that up on YouTube. So, you know, but let's all stay here because we're doing a, a nice recording now. Right. Oh, God. Now, Terry, <laughs> ask me some questions. Um, you ask me some questions. Then at the end, we'll do loads of questions. All right. Because I've got all this stuff here. You want me to ask you questions first? You want me to ask in afterwards? Um, well, do you want me to just to I can just kick off here talking about flashbacks, about the five myths of flashbacks. Um, all right, let me right. do a little introduction. So Linda is going to come, is going to be at the Center Coast Writers Conference um, September 26th in California. Um, and she will be teach, she'll be part of our keynote, which is Creativity Under Pressure, which we just proved we can do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> And then she'll also be teaching the multiverse class, uh, part one and two. So she'll have a two hour workshop and then sit on a couple panels. And we're very, very thrilled to have her. So today she's gonna give you a little tiny bit of something that's not in the class, but something that will really help your writing. So Linda, I'm gonna shut up and let you go. Okay, all right, well, I, I thought I'd start off by talking about some myths about flashback. Um, because I think that they're destructive, they lead people in the wrong way, and we really need to discuss all sorts of things that are being taken for granted. After that, I'm going to talk about, um, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about how you can, how important it is nowadays that television and now that, now that film and television are linked and people who are writing for film are now also writing for television, how important it is for you to understand how to do multiple storyline material, which is you know nonlinear jumping from story to story. And I'm also going to explain to you some of the things that I encounter as a consultant when I'm dealing with people who are trying to fit the um, to fit group stories, stories that are inherently about a group to a one hero model because there are huge problems associated with that. It can actually kill the film. I actually get to see a lot of films that don't go, that, that scripts rather, that don't become films because they have been very damaged by people trying to focus on one central protagonist character where really the material is actually calling for you to look at the group. I mean, if you're going to do the full Monty, the full Monty you have to have a group of men. You can't just have one guy doing it, you know. We can't have the Magnificent One instead of the Magnificent Seven, all right? So let me just kick off now with what I'm going to say about Flash. Now, the first myth, is um, <clears throat> the first myth is that flashbacks are lazy. Well, you know, you can't ascribe a moral failing to a script writing uh, uh, structure. I mean, you can't do it. It's like saying the color blue is you know, really untrustworthy or um, yellow is such a, a, um, such a wicked color. I mean, it, it's a structure. Uh, flashbacks can be badly written, right? They can be badly written. They can be things that you personally don't like, but it's not that the structure is wrong. It is to do with how they are being written. And so that's number one. Flashbacks cannot be lazy. That's a moral failing. And it's actually you to sort of take you off guard. Um, lazy? Lazy? No, just not on. Um, only bad writers use flashback. Well, that means that you're dismissing Homer and Shakespeare because Shakespeare uses flashbacks in, in Henry V. Um, he uses, you have a character in the present who introduces the action much like, you know, a, a speaking to camera. And then we go into the past. This character comes back from time to time to keep reminding you that we are, that, that the story is set in the past and commenting on it, right? So that's Shakespeare. Number two, Homer. 
Now Homer, Homer's Odyssey, which is the um, iconic uh, journey structure of Western civilization, is actually non-linear. It starts in the middle and it has a massive flashback, right? And why is that? It does that to get speed. Now, if you did, if you studied the Odyssey at school, chances are you found it beyond boring. I, I know I certainly did. And that is because it's set up as episodes. It starts chronologically and it moves through all the way to the end. And you can see the problems that are caused by that linear structure repeat themselves in Oh Brother Where Art Thou, which is charming, lovely music, but it's actually rather boring. It meanders, right? Now, let's go back to the how the Odyssey is structured. And stay with me on this because I'm not just, this is really important. It's actually structured a bit like Pulp Fiction, right? It's non-linear. Why? To give energy. How does it start? It starts with a mystery. This guy is um, hes on an island. We don't know anything about him. It goes forward, right? It then jumps across to where the man's wife, in another location, where the man's wife is being forced to marry somebody else, right? Okay. Now, do you see what that gives you? Gives you a ticking clock. We're talking about Homer's Odyssey 3,000 years ago. Gives you a ticking clock, right? Because we know that his wife is in trouble. He doesn't know that. Now, transfer that back to um, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Can you? Can you see how much better that film would have been if George Clooney at the start had not known that his wife was in trouble, right? But we had. Can you see we'd be saying, ah, stop messing about with all these people, get home to your message, you know? That's what we would have been doing. Can you see that? So what happens in, in Homer's Odyssey starts in the middle, goes forward. Somebody, um, finally, he turns up on an island, half drowned, all his crew, the crew of his ship are gone, and people say, who are you? And he says, well, and we go into flashback. And all those adventures, you know, with the Cyclops and all that, they happen then, right? Why? Because we've got the energy, bang, 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 of for God's sake, get off this iron and get back because that woman is under, under pressure and also your son is, is trying to find you, right? All of this stuff, which is not in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And that's why it's slow. Now, these people, you don't have something lasting 3,000 years without it being pretty good. So, you know, that's, 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 that's that. Now, let's get on to, um, uh, it's a fascinating structure and I recommend that you use it if you're trying to do something a bit like that. Anyway, the three act one hero chronological journey structure is the only one and that's how it's always been. Well, we just knocked that one on the head, didn't we? It's actually not true, it's dangerous, right? Um, there are actually you know, Greek novels, ancient Greek novels that had flashbacks in them. Um, the Romans had a word for it. It was in, in Medius Res, starting in the middle. This is a structure. It depends on what kind of material you have, right? Um, and this idea that, you know, it was you know, Aristotle says this. Well, Aristotle also believed, this is absolutely true. Aristotle also believed that men's voices dropped at puberty because of the weight of their testicles. And it was somehow pulling down their larynx. Now, you know, you'd really not want your urologist uh, to believe in Aristotle, would you? Why are we being asked to do this? It's preposterous. It's really very silly. It's trying to give some kind of um, cultural credibility uh, and, and gravitas to an idea that's completely wrong. He's wonderful. Aristotle is clearly wonderful, but look, a lot of things. He also believed in unicorns. You know, let's, let's get real about this. Okay, only some young people, film buff, particularly young men, um, understand flashback. Well, look, I saw Memento, in an afternoon screening, and the combined age of the audience was about 2,000. Nobody had a problem with it. You know, where's the empirical evidence for this? You can dislike uh, Memento, you can dislike the flashbacks as an individual, of course you can, but you can't dismiss wholesale an entire uh, sub uh, category of, of humanity. Were, were there, there surveys done on this? No, it's not. It's just, it's just an argument that's not backed up. Um, gimmick. Right. Now, it's a natural form of storytelling, flashback. Let's imagine, you probably do this all the time, every day, right? Your friend walks in the door. She's at, she looks absolutely shattered, right? <laughs> and you say, what's the matter? And she says, I just got sacked. You say, what? What happened? And she goes back to the start and she goes forward. She repeats what happened. You know, she got sacked and then she, she will move on, right? That is something that I call preview flashback. I've written about it extensively. You use it all the time. Let's rewind. Let's rewind. Let's say that she comes in terrible and you say, what's the matter? And she says, she goes chronological. She says, well, this morning I woke up and I had a cup of coffee and I read the papers and on and on. Can you see it slow? 
And I have to share a story with you. A dear old friend of mine, whom I used to take to the doctor from time to time, had this habit when the doctor would say, what's wrong with you? I'm not saying, well, I have got a pain in my side. She would actually go back to three days before as to how she actually got the pain, right? And you could see the doctor sort of going, cut to the chase, you know, cut to the chase. Um, it was also complicated by the fact that everything from here to where her legs started was called her stomach. So the poor doctors was, was, was very confused. So can you see there's an awful lot of stuff that is being said to you about flashback that's actually being directed at you in an insulting way. <laughs> Personally, you know, you, you must be lazy. You must be a lazy writer. And I'm saying, no, this is a structure. Some structures are better told in flashback. And the Odyssey is interesting, not because I want to go into that you know, their classics or anything, it's because it is providing energy. It's pulling in all of these stories, giving you a ticking clock, right? So this is something that we have to get our heads around. You cannot simply dismiss a, a structure and you simply cannot say nothing has changed since, uh, you know, 3,000 years ago in Aristotle, you know, it's just, just a bit silly, just really. Okay, so that's that. Now, I'm going to move on now. I can just keep talking about this. Um, uh, I'm going to talk now about um, why you should, why you didn't need to get your head around the multiple storylines that I'm going to be talking about at the conference and also in London later, I'll be talking about other stuff. Um, the nonlinear multiple plot stuff is essential. You are actually going to be asked if you write for television to be handling multiple stories at the same time, sometimes five stories at the same time. When you're writing a pilot, you will have to set up these stories in order, the long form series, that they will be able to continue, not only for that season, but beyond that. It is actually an art in itself. And unfortunately, while the one hero five act linear chronological model will help you uh, in some ways, and all the other stuff you know about character development and so on will help you, those skills that you have learned from your screenwriting experience are not going to help you when you have to interweave multiple storylines. It is incredibly difficult. And if you talk to any television writer, you will find out, A, that there are television specific um, strategies that you have to learn, craft skills that you have to learn. And secondly, that every writer I know who's gone into television, even when they have a great deal of experience, has been absolutely shattered because of the pressure and because of the complexity of interweaving storylines and making sure that your story comes in at 52 minutes, um, 30 seconds, and the things that we had to do. I spent a lot of time in television. One of the reasons, actually, I got into all of this nonlinear stuff um, was because I was making a very nice living writing for television, writing multiple interwoven storylines, and people in the screenwriting area were saying there's only one form. And I could see that there was a great deal of benefit, fantastic stuff that these people were saying about one hero models, but it's only one model. There are some models, things that you simply cannot do in that one model form. Um, I feel I'm kind of raving on here. Uh, we maybe, uh, Terry, maybe do you want to take some questions now or shall I continue with my... Um... <laughs> uh, yeah, we have a question. What, yeah, okay. is, what is the danger of using flash black and flash forward in a fractured narrative five act structure well here's the thing you don't this is a good, very very good question thank you for bringing this up don't know who did it but anyway um thank you um what's the date well look there are some structure that you cannot think of looking at a five act structure um as a flashback as being something you just sit on the top you can't do that there is there are nine different sorts of flashback all right there are nine different sorts. Some are very simple, as in, where were you on the night of the crime? And it flashes back and it's a little bit of dramatized backstory. OK, but if you're going to jump between two storylines, you have to construct before you start, you have to construct two storylines and then you have to interweave them and you have to jump on specific moments. Otherwise, the audience will get lost. So you cannot think about it as what is the danger of using flashbacks and flash forwards in a in a five act structure. Don't think of it like that. Think of it as multiple storylines, all right? Think of it as a story in the past and a story in the present, right? You structure those and you jump on cliffhangers between them in a very specific way. The dangers, yes, the dangers are this. If you don't have any reason to jump forward and jump backwards, it gets boring, okay? I talk about a film uh, quite a lot called Paying It Forward, right? Paying It Forward is a film based on a book 
And the idea in the book is that um, if somebody, here's the theory, if somebody does a good turn to you, um, you pay it forward. That is, you don't do a good turn back to them, you do it to a stranger, right? And the film opens with a journalist who is, uh, his car has been stolen, suddenly a complete stranger um, says to him, uh, have my car. And the guy says, what are you doing? And the man says, I'm paying it forward. It's then very rapidly explained what paying it forward means. And as the, um, but the story in the present shows us the journalist trying to track all the way back to where this started. But we know that it actually started with a young boy who was asked as a homework exercise to think of something that would help people. He thought of this. And that is, this, we stay, we go and see this story, very nice little story with Kevin Spacey and oh, what, some other good actress, um, as Kevin Spacey's the teacher, the, oh, what's her name, I can't think of her name, but anyway, she is the mum, and there's the little boy, and there's a kind of little love thing between the two, and so it's a very nice story, but in the present, you keep cutting back to this journalist who's talking to a bunch of random people who somehow had a nice thing done to them. It's pointless, it's useless, right? So in that case, you don't want to be, have to be servicing that story in the present, do you see? It's, it depends on the content. The new rule that we have to say is not that there is just one structure, this one, one monolithic structure, because there isn't, simply isn't. It's your, co your content. Does your content suit this kind of structure? And if you have a story, much like um, uh, Citizen Kane, where you have somebody dead and you want to go back and try to find out what happened to this person, you have a story in the present and you have a story in the past and you jump between the two. So the dangers of it are if, the, if there is no reason to keep going back to the present, don't do it. The point about flashbacks is that flashbacks properly used are clues to a problem in the present. But if there is no problem in the present, you shouldn't be going back there. I actually do spend a lot of time telling people, you don't need flashback, don't do flashback. Um, so there's a great deal of this in my book, The 21st Century Screenplay. There's something like 30,000 words on different families of flashback, right? So it is a difficult form, it's not easy, but there are dangers there. There are dangers that you will, number one, that you will lose pace because People get lost because you're not, number one, you're not jumping at the right places. There are places that you need to jump. There are patterns to this. Um, the problem is that once you start to leave uh, one story and jump into multiple stories and multiple time frames, um, people think, well, why? And you can get lost. Um, and really, it, it does, does depend on the content. You just, you don't, ju never jump back when the film is getting slow because you'll get a bit of energy. But when you Come back from the flashback you've still got the same problem haven't you do you see what i mean there's just a great deal that's wrapped up in that question to me and i will be saying if you're at the conference come along and i will be talking about this if you're in london there's a there's a two-day master class in london where i will be talking about this but also i would strongly suggest you get hold of my book 21st century screenplay which of course i don't have a copy of around here but the 21st century screenplay and i go into it in depth and i walk you through it which I, of course, obviously can't do even in these long, um, these, these two day masterclass, can't give you all of it, all of the detail. I hope that's that's helped. Um, but the main thing to take away from this, don't think of this as being, you know, you've got this linear structure, this linear chronological structure, and you're gonna somehow sit flashback on top of it. It doesn't work like that. You have to think of it as different stories and structure them differently and then put them together. I hope that's useful. Anything, anybody else got a question? Yeah? Yes. Any questions? Um, yes. So Ian would like to know, is there an, an ideal number of protagonists? Ah, oh, that's a question that often comes up. When you're doing a, it depends on what you're doing, all right? If you're doing something, it, it, what I call multiple protagonists is when you have a group on some kind of mission or reunion or, um, or, uh, or um, a siege. That, that could be a sort of social siege, a family locked together. If you, there, the energy of the story, see, this gets us back to the topic and the subject matter. The energy of the story is the interaction of this family or this group of people and how they react to some kind of crisis, okay? If you're dealing with that sort of thing, then I would say about six, because then you've got time to go to all of these separate people. You can have a group of six that you study closely with more people behind, you know, in the background, but the six at the center, I will be saying with that. Um, 
However, if you are going to do something that a, a structure that is a bit like, say, traffic, where the point of the story is that you go off into separate um, storylines with people, you know, scattered around the world or in different towns or different stories, you can have a lot of characters in that. You know, think of traffic. There's, there's a great number of characters. But you see, the thing about that is a different type of story. It's not about a group on one quest or locked together in some problem, in some group problem. It is about people reacting to um, a certain, uh, pro usually a social problem. So you can say about um, uh, multiple protagonists that the, the, the uh, it's one team, one story. Okay, with with the what I call um, tandem narrative, which is equally important stories running in the same time frame. Sometimes with a bit of uh, mucking about time frames, but often not. That is one th same theme, different adventures. Right. So in traffic, it's all different versions of people involved in in um, should we have drugs and the the war against drugs. All right. Do you see that? So you can have loads of people in that because they're sort of quarantined into different stories. If you're going to do a family about six is probably the, 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 the top number that you can do. And you will have somebody who I call the instigator who causes the problem. And that person can be dead, as in the big chill. It can be a little girl, as in a little you know, a person without power, as in Little Miss Sunshine. Or it can be something in the, like the Full Monty where there's one guy has an idea and ropes in his friends. Do you see? So I would say about it, depending on what the structure is. Now, there's not just one multiple protagonist structure there are several um, several structures that use lots of people, right? But multiple protagonist, I use it in a very spe specific way, and that is a group of people involved in the same joint adventure, locked together. And the joy of the, the story, the story material, is that they are that that they um, you want to see how they all react. Now you can go to my website, and there's sort of help. I forget what the heading is but in there it says which structure suits my material and I give you a lot of answers there about that because you have to choose the right structure for your material okay hope that answers that one okay now something about this I can see something here one more um, yeah okay what is it about a whole village and you have about <laughs> six main characters and some very small stories for some of the rest just to give them three dimension Okay, this is interesting because it takes me to something that I was going to talk about anyway. Sophia, okay, it does, um, when you're dealing with a whole village, uh, there are dangers in that, um, and there are big advantages in that. It really depends what you're trying to do. Now, if you, the way to show, um, you can have lots of different stories setting in the same kind of location, and that will I what I would call a tandem narrative, okay? One of the problems about that is that you usually need something to join them together in some way, right? Some kind of joint problem. I'll give you an example of, of how this sort of thing can go wrong. I, I should say, I should say that having not read your scripts, I'm only talking generally, you know, so do understand that. <clears throat> if you have a group of people and, you, and the idea is that you want to explore a village, right? That's that's a group of people, right? Um, you have to be quite careful about that. You have to understand it, that it is a group structure, okay? It is not about one hero. There's a story, uh, a film that actually was made uh, that I often talk about um, because it did the wrong thing. It put a central protagonist in the centre of the story. And what it was, the writer, director wanted to write about a group of people who lived together in this sort of strange, um, on, on a river bank. There was a, there's a, there's a particular place in, in around Sydney, there's a river and you get all sorts of strange people living along the banks of this river. So that was the impetus. That was what this person wanted to write about. Somebody at some point in the, in the production said, who's the hero in this? So this writer took, invented a young man who'd done a robbery and was escaping to hide in this area. So a lot of effort was put into this one young man. But you see, once you've set up that young man, she had to follow that young man, right? So what happened to all these other people um, was that um, they just sort of appeared and sort of did funny things and went off again and the film just died, right? Now, with your kind of story, it's hard to say. I would be say often 
if you want to give some sense of unity, you might want to give them a joint problem, as in chocolat or something, a joint that the village has a joint problem. You can, though, simply have the village um, and follow each separate story. It's nice to give them something to unite them. You might find that there is some kind of, it's different versions of the same problem, you know, same theme. Maybe the theme is how difficult it is to live in a little village, right? And then you're going to look at different aspects of that. Um, I th think really what you do need to do is to look at my book, The 21st Century Screenplay, because it looks at this in detail. I'm sorry to keep going on about the book, but really it's very hard to give you a short answer. Um, I All think, right. yeah, does that help? Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I yes awesome I love that you're promoting your book that's the whole point of it all <laughs> well, well not really not really no, I, look, I have to tell you about this book the only reason I wrote that book was because I spent the advance that's a real writer's life it's like oh god oh my gosh that's awesome yeah. all right <laughs> all okay. right so there we have two questions how mm -hmm. do you know where your where best your story could work being between written as a TV series or as a future feature? Well, a feature is one self-contained story. Uh, and I, this this is often coming up. Um, if you want to do a television drama series, I've wrote a lot of television drama series in my time, right? And I talk to a lot of people about this now. Um, you have to be able to have a television drama series that will that will hold together over a series of episodes. That is, so it's the difference between creating a hundred minutes of a story, a hundred minute story, and a story that maybe will have, you know, like that will go on for years, like Breaking Bad. Now, do you have that amount of story? If you want to go into television writing as television drama series, it is very complicated. And I'm sorry to have to say that, but it, it simply is um, having to interweave all of those kinds of, of story. It, I would be saying, if you can happily tell your story in uh, the, the like 100 and 120 minutes, I would do it that way. The only issue now is that, uh, you know, television is the biggest game in town. It's quite hard to get a film made. But I think unless you do some get some craft skills in television writing, you will you will find it extremely difficult to um, to write it as a television series. Also, Unless things have changed quite a lot, and they are changing, they're changing quite um, worryingly in the in the television industry because you're getting a lot of, of producers who've come in from film who don't actually understand the logistical problems and the writing problems of television, and they are actually employing inexperienced writers to write television drama series, and those writers are having problems because you know you have to give people a lot of time to write a five-part series. Um, so I would be saying, get yourself some kind of training in television writing so that you can understand how to into, how to plan stories. And for example, I've spoken to some, I know there are some people online here, I think I've spoken to in, in, in a, a webinar that I did on television writing for London. And you know, okay, to get 50 minutes of television, we use 18 plot beats, right? 18 beats, uh, sorry, 36 plot beats, 18 for main story, 12 for the serial content and six for sort of, you know, little story of the week. That's how that's how precise it is, right? You have to make sure, sometimes you don't have the actors because they're only on contract to do two or three episodes or something. Some you have, have to work out what sets you're going to use. Uh, Downton Abbey, for example, a lot of that's being done in Ealing Studios where I'll be working when I'm in London. Uh, it's not all done on set. You have to be, understand the, the budget. It's all driven by budget. And I would be saying, if you have never written for television, be very careful about trying to write your stuff as a television drama series because most producers want to know, you know, 12 episodes. They want to know pilot and they want to see what's in 12 episodes. If your producer doesn't ask you for that, well, maybe some producers these days are not asking for that. But in my time, you could only sell it if you could prove that you could do it. And the other thing is you also have to prove that you can work with other writers because if you're writing a 12 part drama series, um, you know, you might not be writing it all yourself. So you have to be able to tell writer number seven what's going to happen in that person's uh, episode or have some very clear idea so that they will be able to do it writing at the same time that you're doing episode two. Do you see? That's the logistics of it. It really is a whole other industry. And there's a lot of people that I'm dealing with who are trying to make the transition and, um, you know, having having problems with that. 
Um, yeah, okay. I don't know if that uh, really answers the question. If you're a person who's no, in I London. Did. I think it yeah. answers the question. Yeah. Okay. All right, next question. Um, I've paid editors in Australia, but they tend to struggle with the fractured narrative structure. Can you recommend editors who understand it? Well, I, I, I no, I'm not going to do that because I actually don't know who's doing that sort of thing. I do uh, in Australia or in, anywhere else. I know that I bizarrely seem to be the only person who's writing a lot about this sort of material. I would say the people who I'd say understand in the states too. Well, yeah, and I I do a lot of work with a lot with people on it. But you see, this idea that there is one structure, this one three act structure or five act structure or seven sequence structure, you know, chronological one hero, it has such a firm hold on certain groups of people in the industry, it's very hard to break through on that. And But I have to tell you that when I talk to television people about what I do and, you know, flashbacks and all that, they, they sort of say, yeah, they, they don't have any problem with thinking in terms of multiple storylines because you have to be able to do that in television. You don't last for five minutes in television unless you can do multiple storylines. So um, as opposed, so uh, in terms of working with, with people who, find it hard to work on fractured stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know why that's the case. And I don't really don't know. I've been doing this for 20 years. I don't know why there aren't more people doing it, but you know, that's the game. Uh, um, you know, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to talk about something I recommend people. I, I don't, you know. All right, next question. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is from Sophia. Uh, can you have your first act turning point um, the umbrella of the storyline quite early and then take some time to introduce the characters and their stories while the umbrella story unravels at the same time? Well, I think I would need to actually look at that script to make a comment about that because one of the first things that, that comes to me about it is that there are there's certain strip structures, I mean, uh, that... Um, that, that, that I, th I think are very vague about how you set up a story. They're not useful. Um, you know, there's this thing, the catalyst, and people say, well, it's the catalyst. Well, I would be using a more precise um, approach to that. I will be splitting it up saying that, well, you know, you see, maybe what you're talking about, Sophia, is, is sort of what I would call a disturbance, like sort of a kickoff of the story. Like, for example, we have somebody and they're living their life and they break their ankle, right? I would call that a disturbance. And then I would call the first act turning point what happens when, for example, they've broken their ankle. So suddenly they happen to be in the hospital and they see something, they see somebody getting murdered, right? If you broke it up like that, then you've got a, a that's what I would call the first act turning point. I would be saying a lot of films that come outside of the uh, American model, and I think this is also something that we do need to talk about actually have a different kind of setup to the American model and they actually take a longer while to get set up and they have before they get to the first act turning point. It's very hard for me to to, to be precise about this um, uh, Sophia because um, I'm not sure exactly what your script is like but I would be saying I think you know you, you, you can't make it too slow. Do you see what I mean? You can kick off you can make it, you, you can, you've got to get the audience on board, but you can't then have something that's too slow afterwards. But I don't really think that's a question I can answer generally, you know, without knowing what the script is. Has anybody else got um, any yes. questions? Yes. Okay. Next question. How popular is closed episode series approach in TV drama? Example, three or four episodes. Is this trend growing? Yeah, well, I think it is. I think I think it's like the Wild West out there at the moment. Everybody's trying to get things up. <laughs> they really are. And I think, but the point is, who are you going to sell this to? Because if I were a producer, and I work on both sides of the table, I've been a very experienced, I'm a very experienced writer, you know, you're around for a long while, you get to do a lot of stuff, but I also work for producers. And I would be saying, this person looks quite good, but are they going to fall, on, fall flat in the face? Because if they are, which is completely natural, it's not... It's not about ta it's not about not having talent to get into television. It's about understanding the rules of television, right? If a writer doesn't know enough about the model <clears throat> and, and about what the, the budgetary restrictions on television, you if the worry is that they might sort of go into meltdown at episode two, in which case you're going to have to pull in some experienced writers to do it fast, and they, that is expensive. So unless you write the whole thing. 
um, which, you know, I, I don't know whether they're doing that now. Um, I, I think really you need to get some practice uh, in trying to write for television before you try to do series series television. And you need to learn about the, the, the problems governing you because you can write something that's wildly expensive or, you know, one episode might last an hour and a half and the other one might be 20 minutes. You know, it, there's a lot of things to, to take on board with that. But I would be saying, yes, I keep seeing stuff that is uh, five episodes long, but do your homework and understand something about the logistics of television, the fact that you might not have that actor every episode, that you might have to do a lot of this in, in the studio. I mean, here's an example. When I did my first television episode and I was quite a successful um, theatre playwright, I did this whole, I got this whole episode ready for them. It was a cop show and it was gang warfare, but we couldn't afford the gang. <laughs> it's just as simple as that. <laughs> You know, you might have a wonderful idea and they say, well, no, well, we, we're already de developing something like that. Do, do you see what I mean? It is a different industry. And again, this is another kind of uh, sort of uh, thing that I'm talking to people a lot about, that you have to understand the rules of television specific writing skills, OK, which are different in addition to what you've already done for film. I, OK, and, I have a question. So here yeah. in the States, when when a series um, gets going, or sometimes in the beginning, they have what they call a Bible for the series, which outlines the rules of that universe. Do you work with those? And do you create them ahead of time or do you let it organically happen? Well, what you do is what I recommend. Uh, <laughs> you see, I hesitate to say this because <laughs> there's a book of mine called Television Writing, The Ground Rules of Series, Serial and Sitcom. Okay, it's a little book, it's online. It's, it's only about the traditional model. I haven't done the latest stuff that I do with all of the, you know, sort of the very senior writers about um, how to use nonlinear. Um, uh, yeah, because I just haven't got around to it. Um, the Bible. The, the Bible. If, yeah, the, okay. Usually what, in my experience, usually what happens is that you have an experienced writer who is brought on to devise the pilot and get the Bible going. I would be saying to producers um, and to anybody who's, who's attempting to write, you must actually have a, a, a document, right? You must be like a lawyer. Everything that you create must go into the Bible, all the character outlines, any kind of story outlines. If somebody has blue eyes, that goes down there because you don't want um, somebody later on to talk, be talking about, uh, you know, them having green eyes. Um, if somebody, if, if you're doing a long form series, um, you find that you get an audience that's very passionate about your material. So if somebody has measles, if a child has measles in the show in, you know, 2015, they kind of, uh, people will, will remember this because their own child had measles, you know, they get very angry if you're out of uh, sync with what you do. So the other thing is, if you're a writer, here's a tip, you're a writer coming into a show, even the worst kind of show, because you usually get your jobs on, on the sort of the, you know, the not so classy shows, first of all, you scour the Bible to find out some little bit of information about one of those characters and you write your story around that. Because then you pull it back into the series and everybody thinks you're absolutely wonderful, right? You also walk the sets and you use bits of the sets that nobody else has used. <laughs> no, I love that. All right, one more yes. question. Could yep. one write a screenplay where you start with an arrest for a crime and then go on a narrative that interweaves flashbacks to reveal what the arrest was for and why it caused a scandal? I'm currently working on a historical crime that caused a scandal and wondering what would be the best structure. Okay. I tr yes, you can you can do that. And we have to look at this in the in the um there are a number of different structures that you could use for that. For example, if you've if you've just seen Chernobyl, have you seen the Chernobyl television drama series? That actually starts out with um, you know, it's about the nuclear meltdown in, in Chernobyl in, in um what was then the Soviet Union. It starts out telling us quite a bit, but bits get revealed as we go along. Yes. The point is um what you have to, the, I would suggest that uh, it's perfectly reasonable to start with that. What would happen is that, um, think of Slumdog Millionaire, right? It opens with this young man getting arrested and being beaten up, right? And gradually we go into the past and we learn a little bit about what happened in the past. Then we come back to the present, a little bit more about what happened in the past and so on. Do you get me? That is a, that is a structure which is called double narrative flashback. So what you are going to do, I would strongly suggest whoever's asked this, 
is that you are going to um, think of the story in the present as one story and the story in the past as another story. You're going to structure them as three act structures because that's where we use the three act structure. And you are going to um, open in the beginning with uh, with um, this, this arrest and then go every time you go forward a little bit in the story in the present, you're going to go back to the past, fill us in a bit and jump back to and fro. That's incredibly uh, an incredibly simple explanation of that. Yes, you can do it, but you have to know where to jump. Essentially, you are jumping on specific cliffhangers. The point about all of this, these apparently um, apparent aberrations, these flashbacks, the pulp fictions, all, the, all these sorts of things, they work on, this, on patterns and the patterns are universal and they go back thousands of years. You know, they are, it is a, a form of storytelling, nonlinear storytelling. So I would say certainly, yes, check out double narrative flashbacks. But you have to proceed, you have to plan it, right? Because if you don't plan it, you will get in a mess and you will just irritate the audience. And I'll tell you for one thing, what people have problems with is the story in the present, because everything inside you, you're dying to write the story in the past, right? You've got to keep focusing on the story in the present so that it's strong, all right? Look at it, look at um, uh, look at the life of David Gale to see how that's done. Look at Slumdog Millionaire to see how it's done. It you, You're talking about a form of flashback a double narrative flashback, but you have to structure carefully and it's, it's structured a bit like concentric circles. Anyway, I, as I said, I'll explain that. So I have a question. When you create yeah. the characters, are you using like myth-based archetypes to do it? Or are you just randomly pulling your characters out of your imagination? Sometimes the first, sometimes the second. You know, I mean, it's it's very useful if you're stuck to think, uh, particularly if you're writing television, people wanting to write television, thinking, okay, well, maybe let's do Hamlet. You know, we'll do Hamlet. Uh, um, the Lion King is Hamlet, you know. Right. Uh, do you see what I mean? Sometimes I do myth mythical things, sometimes I don't. Uh, one of the things I'll be talking about in Creativity Under Pressure is um, how you actually cope with your natural instinct to pull towards cliches because you go to memory banks that's what we tend to do we tend in in life generally we use memory banks if you find out a nice way to make an omelet you do it the same way every time right you can't do that in 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 tele, in writing you have to be original each time so anything that's going to help you i mean all the things that i do i ha i should explain everything that i do is about the, the technique of writing i'm there's 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 the what and the how of writing and uh, a lot of people just need to know the what. If you're a film critic or something, you only need to know the what. But we have to know the how. So everything that I'm doing is is um, is about uh, helping you as a writer. So if you're stuck, go to myth, go to myths. Myths actually nice structure. I tell you what, a myth. Go to some of these myths because they're actually really good story structures and set them in the present. You know, fables are good too. It's a story structure that works. So the the nefarious character that I am, I'm putting you on stage with a mythologist. So it'll be interesting oh, to see. <laughs> no, that's absolutely fine. That's that's absolutely fine. I'm just interested in in having as many different ways as possible to make me right at the top of my game. Because really, it's like being an Olympic performer. You know, you, you have to <laughs> you have to keep trying to push yourself forward. So I would take anything. I, I think this is a lovely idea. Yeah. And, and I'm a great admirer of Christopher Vogler's stuff, one here on one journey and, uh, you know, single, uh, the, the hero's journey and all that. It's just that, that it's not the only way to do it. And I think that we're all looking for simple answers. Unfortunately, it's, it's not a simple answer. You know, there's no simple answers here. <laughs> now, um, I think I've sort of covered all the things that I was going to talk about in my extra uh, comments. Um, but have we got any more store uh, any more questions? <laughs> this seems a strange. Yes, song. we have one. What are okay. the key differences between writing live action and writing for animation? Well, that's an interesting one. Um, I've never written for animation. I've been asked to, but I've, I've always been too busy, um, tied up, unfortunately, with other things. Um, I don't know. I would imagine there would be quite a lot of stuff to do with the fact that you are um, uh, talking to certain actors to do it, and they might want to put have some input and, and so on. I can't really, I can't really say about that. I'm a scripted person. I would script everything. I would then work with actors, and I modify according to the actors. So on. I never work with actors in mind because you're never quite sure 
if they're going to be available, but if they then are available, you can then work around them. So that's really not, not in my area. I've done loads of things, but not animation. Sorry. Anything else? <laughs> It's a stunned silence from you all. No, sorry. The neighbor's dog <laughs> ran in the house and I had to mute me. So when you got started, did you have to have an agent or did you just submit your stories? How did you get your start? Um, I actually submitted for some competitions. I, mean, I was always writing, but I and then the people started to take notice of me. At which point, um, uh, I was approached by one agent, and later, you know, as, as plays got put on, I would be saying, "Can I just come in here about agents and about how you break into the business?" Now it is rather different now because we've got all this stuff with web TV and how you can break in. But I would so I would say, make your own opportunities, right? Because unfortunately. Um, the film and TV world is not waiting for you to arrive. However, the people who are looking for you are the theatre people. So what you're going to do is you're going to get a bunch of actors together because actors love to work for you. You're going to work writing plays for them, put them on at the local pub or, you know, wherever. Get your friends together and do some web TV. Make your own opportunities because every writer has been a new writer once and every writer I know apart from a few, you know, <laughs> reprobates. Every writer I know is very sympathetic to people who are hungry and who go out there and do it. But, you know, people who are just sort of hoping that it's going to happen, it just doesn't happen because the money is so huge in all of this. The money is huge and producers are crazy people. They mortgage their houses, you know. I would never do that for a script personally. So I'd be saying to you, if you really want to break into the business, show people a start that you can do dialogue because it's crucial if you're work we work as as dramatists we work with dialogue we do everything through dialogue a lot of stuff that is the subtext right so write some plays get them on try to invite important people along just come and see them go in for competitions don't be timid um if somebody has actually praised your work a little bit you you include that in your uh, when you're talking to other people um you don't pester people but at the same time you know you 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 show that you can you're actually interested in it and i always say to people the way i got in the way a load of people i know got in is through the theater because you you then actually leapfrog a lot of other other people in the queue because they can see that you're a playwright and that's a bit of status in that you know so that's and then I have to put my two, my two cents in here too. You should go to writers' yeah. conferences because yeah, at writers' go. conferences. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> can I tell you something? Can I, can I share something with you on this? Yes, please. I, where I made my break was that I arrived. I I had been writing in England. I I came to Australia and I arrived at a time when there was a big boom in the arts industry. And I submitted a play to something called the Australian National Playwrights Conference, and. It went in there and it just, you know, that was the start of my career because you're suddenly starting to talk to writers and you people are suddenly seeing, oh, look, you know, there's talent there. People, these are the people who will recognize talent, you know, but there are so many people trying to break into television and get, get some kind of writing gig. Do you see what I mean? You really, really a lot of it is being at the right place at the right time, as we all know. But if you go to conferences, you can find yourself having a cup of coffee with somebody and finally get on well and they, Think about remember you you know if they if there's a chance to get your play read and people see it you know you are surrounding yourself with 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 the industry don't sort of lock yourself up it's also very nice to see other writers because you know they are your tribe <laughs> it's not natural what we do sitting around pretending to be other people you know it's not natural go out to conferences i would strongly suggest that yeah, yeah me yes. too yeah. <laughs> Okay, another question from Jack Jackie. Does the double narrative structure have one or two main protagonists? Well, you can have lots of different protagonists. Um, can you be uh, the double the double narratives flashback? Okay. There's look, I talk about six different families of, of nonlinear structure, right? And within that there are subcategories. So I am talk I introduce you to a series of different structures that amount to over 20, all right? It really does depend on the content. 
So for example, Brokeback Mountain requires you, in order to tell the story that needs to be told, to follow two men into their separate lives. That means you, they have to be protagonists when they're in their own story. Then when they're together, you have a joint story. Do you see that? I've just watched The, um, the Favourite, this film uh, about Queen Anne, and there you've got a double journey structure where you've got two uh, individuals, you've got the queen in the middle and you've got these two women who are vying for her, um, for her uh, favours, if you like. Um, and that's, you've got to follow each one of those in their separate journey. You have to construct plot around them. You see, the thing about this is lose the idea, lose this rigidity of a kind of academic approach. Now I'm, you know, I spent years as an academic, I did all sorts of things, but um, it's different when you're writing. It's about how you can construct the stories. Think of it as two protagonists. So if you actually have something like Brokeback Mountain where you're following two people, that is a structure that I call a double journey structure, right? That's one of the six families. It's a it's a version of multiple protagonist structure, double journey. So um, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether that, it's very hard to answer these things in the abstract. No, you answered it well. You answered it really well. All right, hmm, okay. another question. <laughs> Can you share your research process for a script based on a subject that you're not quite familiar with? Oh, I can do. <laughs> do you know, I am an expert in um, different sorts of metal alloys because I once did a, <laughs> once wrote a script about um, an early aviator. So, you know, yes, yes. And do you and now you're an I'm expert a on <laughs> webinars now too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me just explain how, how you go about this, right? Um, you, you need to interview, you need to do a lot of background reading, uh, you need to interview people, because you can never, ever think of the weird things that you will find out when people tell, when you interview people about their topic of choice. People love to talk about their topic of choice, but their patience is limited. So what you need to do before you interview people is you need to set down questions that you want to ask them. Um, and you need to take a, a tape recording of what they say, right? Don't uh, sort of push your luck too much because they can just get impatient with you. Um, what I would then say is that you are in danger of being overwhelmed by the material. You need to step back from that and to say, okay, I've got all of this material and I'm going to create a story about this, right? What is the story in this? Now, if you're doing a life story, if you're doing the, the life of some famous person, let's take, um, oh, goodness, what was the story about the, the King of England and the chap who, um, and who taught him how to overcome his stammer? Oh. The, the King's Speech, the King's Speech. Right. King's Speech is, about this uh, speech pathologist, if you like, it does not follow his entire life. It follows this episode in his life, which sums up his life, if you like. So a life of itself is not necessarily a story. There might be a period in this person's life that if you're doing about an individual or a group of people, that is the crucial germ of the story. So number one, try to pull back from it, pull back from this mountain of material, which you find fascinating, others might not, right? You've got to make them fascinating. You pull back from that, and then you go through trying to find the story, right? The other thing that, um, that you uh, have to be aware of is if you are dealing with famous people, do not be tempted to include them just because they're famous. And so you have a scene, for example, where you have a lot of famous people sitting around a table uh, and they're all talking. And the only reason that they're there is because, you know, they're Clark Gable or whatever. They're not pushing the story forward. That happens in a, in a film that I saw, I can't remember the name of it. It was about Charlie Chaplin. And it, there were scenes with a lot of really famous old sort of Hollywood stars. But the scenes were redundant. It was only interesting if you happen to be interested in, you know, certain stars of the 1930s. So I would be saying, You've got to do a lot of research, right? But then at this, uh, I would be saying, you know, make sure that you label all of your research, but keep fight that it has to be a story. It has to engage people. Here's a trick too. <laughs> Don't try this on your nearest and dearest because they're trying to please, right? So you see this wild look in their eyes if they're trying to say the right thing, all right? You do this hopefully on something that you don't know too well um, and you describe what you're writing. 
And if you don't get any, if there's a blank expression, right, or you get a sort of, oh, that's interesting, you know that you haven't quite got what I would call the spark, right? The spark. The minute, just keep talking if you can hold them. In. Watch to see where their eyes light up, or they, if it's a comedy, if they smile, right? Because that's what they want, and you have to sell that, right? So I know this because when I wrote my first novel, which I wrote in order to stop myself killing a producer, I have to say, so I wrote this novel and got picked up and translated all the place. Anyway, I was asked to write something on the back cover. I had no idea what to write, but I did notice that when I spoke to people, they said, what's your novel about? That mostly they were sort of seeing they're being very polite, but there was one thing that they all laughed about. This was a comic novel. So I went back and I put a lot of that in. If you're doing a story about a romance on Mars, you have to do a lot of romance and a lot of Mars. You can't get pulled away to do some other character, right? Now that's going to be your problem in this material. You have to stay focused and you have to stay focused on what is interesting to other people because you are fascinated with it. It might not be fascinating to other people, right? So try this, look for the spark, just, okay? That's what I would do. All right, so I think this will be our last question. To what okay. extent does the theme or thesis statement of a feature determine which type of structure you use? Example, is there certain themes that work better with particular structures? Well, it does depend what the theme is, I suppose. And I think that there is a, a problem here because I think that when a lot of people talk about theme, they talk, they, what they're really talking about is what the audience reacts to. Because I've heard theme described in so many different ways. You know, what's the theme of this? And, uh, you know, it can be a moral statement like uh, don't trust other people, or it, it can be what I've heard described inaccurately, I'm afraid, as catharsis, where everybody just feels really good at the end. You know, I would be saying that um, theme. I'll tell you where it, where it does come in. Okay. If you have a socio-political theme, right? If you want to do something like the war on drugs or the war on unemployment or, you know, how terrible it is for, to be homeless, right? The structure that will suit you there is probably going to, not always, probably going to be a tandem narrative. For example, if I wanted to do something about homeless people, the interesting thing for me to do would be to um, think of different versions of a homeless person plus different versions of the people who are trying to either help the homeless person or get rid of the homeless people. But what I would also do there, right? So, so your theme there is homelessness, right? But you're gonna, but we are dramatists, so we dramatize that. We put, we make all these different stories, but you're gonna have to hold those stories together. Otherwise it could become an anthology of short films. So what you might want to do is have a joint problem. So for example, let's say, the Olympics are going to be held in a city, but there are a load of homeless people. So over, you have this a homeless people who are being homeless and having their problems of being homeless. They're faced with being forced off the streets. There's a problem that affects them. It also affects the people who want to help them and the people who hate them. Do you see that? So that, that's what I call the macro plot. And you can see that in some loose as Nashville, where you've got the macro plot is actually there's an election campaign coming up. It's very slight, but it's holding all of those stories together. Otherwise, they will tend to fracture. So again, I would say, uh, look at my uh, advice on tandem narrative. You hold these things together by connection in theme, right? But also often it's a connection in location so they can walk into and out of each other's stories, right? L literally walk into and out. Other times it is to do with some characters appearing in one story and in another. For example, in the one I, I gave you, the Olympic story, you might have somebody who wants to help the homeless, who has a bit of a battle with somebody who's trying to get rid of the homeless. Do you see, you might have that, but your overarching story there is the Olympics and, the, and you've got a ticking clock there because they want to get all these, you know, unpleasant homeless people off the streets before the Olympics. Do you see, do you see what I'm saying here? So I would be saying it does depend, but in that particular case, if you have a, a, a socio-political theme, which is um, we need to do something about this, right, tandem narrative, there's another form, fractured tandem narrative, which is, you know what, life sucks. You can be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's often about accidents, people being thrown together and dreadful things happening through no fault of their own. Crash is one of nope. those. 
um, Ariagra as stuff is is often about that, you know, amores peros, um, and so on. So yes, there, there, there are structures, but uh, you know, always whatever I'm saying is a bit of the proviso because these are very general questions that I'm answering. Okay. All right. Last question from me. What's your favorite movie? Do you know, people always ask me this. I have so many favorite movies. And uh, look, um, I saw a very interesting film. It's sort of the last one I've seen, really, you know. Um, I saw a very interesting Italian film called Dog Man, which is a very disturbing film. And it's interesting structurally and for us as writers, because actually it's a tragedy. So it doesn't have this everything is, you know, people learn and grow at the end. It just is a relentless um, movement towards a horrible ending. And so that's actually a different structure, different meaning, but also a different structure. So Dogman, Italian film. The other one I've just seen recently is, um, oh, Never Look Away, which is again a German film. Best uh, American film. The ones that stick out for me are Three Billboards, which I loved, Spotlight, which I loved. Um, yeah, look, there's just too many for me to say that what, what's my favorite, but um, cause you know, yeah, there's wonderful. We're we're all addicts, aren't we? We're all um, we're all hopeless cases of uh, film. Yeah, action. and writing movies has ruined watching movies for us for the rest of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no, I don't think that. I think it's just lovely when you see something that's really good and you think, God, I wish I'd written that. I really wish I'd written that. You know, which I can do. Anyway, look for everybody who's here. I think we're about to break up now. Um, it's been really lovely, and thank you for putting up with all of the hassle at the start. I've no idea what happened, but anyway, um, we figured it out. We're experts now. We figured it out. We figured it out. Come to the conference if you're in London. I'm doing a bunch of stuff in London on film and television, in London, and um, also, you know, there's a lot of stuff on my website that will give you an introduction to this, but. You've got to take this sensibly. This is not easy. The stuff, alas, love it to be easy. And you can just work through um, th this different kind of mindset that you need for, for this non stuff. Okay. All right. So <laughs> I'm going to turn this into a YouTube link and then I will okay. share it on the Central Coast Writers Conference YouTube channel and then send it to Linda so she can share it too. So you can rewatch okay. it or share it. And if any of you are in the States, please come to California and meet. Linda, we're very excited to have her here. Okay, well, thank you, Terry. Thank you for being so patient. Thank you, everybody, for being so patient. I'm really looking forward to, to coming to the conference. And look, it's going to be a good laugh. We'll have good fun. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.